rest of us can turn over to John chapter 5. So this week we're going to wrap up John chapter 5. We've preached four sermons, or this will be the fourth, uh, from the chapter. It has proven to be a very powerful chapter in the Word of God. Um, and in it we have seen how false beliefs impact the lives of people. We saw it with the sick man who had been ill for 38 years, and he believed in this superstition that when the waters were stirred, that if he were the first one to get down in the water, then he would be healed. But he'd been sick for 38 years. He couldn't make it down before someone else would step in and, and they would become healed. And so he had placed his hopes in, in this uh, superstition that uh, had not, nor would it ever, be able to cure him of what ailed him. We saw it in the Jews who were angered because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath and in their minds had violated the Sabbath through his actions. Their anger was generated because of their false beliefs and oral traditions regarding the Sabbath. Add to that the fact that Jesus referred to God as his Father, and they became incensed with anger, and they began to plot to kill Jesus. In our second sermon, we read where Jesus and God, and, and Jesus and God the Father are one. Jesus could do nothing apart from his Father, nor could he do anything that was out of character for the Father. Jesus came into this world to do his Father's will, not his own will. Uh, well, when you think about that, I think uh, oftentimes whenever I read and, and Jesus says that, you know, I, I came not to do my will but the will of my Father, it's convicting. Because we've got so many people in the world today that uh, as they're going along through their life, they'll hit periods of time maybe where they'll just say, well, I'm going to do what I want to do. I've had people say to me, well, I know what the Bible says, but. The moment that they, they throw that little uh, word but out there, guess what we have? We have a war with God going on. I know what the scripture says, but I'm going to go do this. Why? I've always wondered about that. Why would you say that? Why would you even contemplate saying that I know what God wants me to do, but I'm going to go do something different? Why would you want to go to war with God like that? You're never going to win uh, in those circumstances. I've had people uh, who, while they were living in sin, and very adamantly, they would say to me, don't tell me that God doesn't want me to be happy. I had one man stop here one night, and um, uh, we, we, uh, he, he and his wife and kids had attended for a very short time here, and he stopped in, and him and his wife were separated, and they were having some back and forth, and, and he began to tell me how God had sent him this woman to live with him. And I stopped him, and I said, well, now, wait a minute, I want to be clear about something here. God didn't send you a woman to commit adultery with. Satan sent that woman. All right? Let's be clear about this. So I haven't seen him since, uh, but he got the truth. Last week we read that the hour is coming and now is. Jesus made it clear that not only did he have power over life and death in the world, but that he had the power to provide life for all eternity. The future holds two resurrections. The first resurrection will be for those who died in Christ and will be risen for their heavenly reward. The second resurrection will be for those who rejected Jesus Christ and they will rise to their eternal punishment. So today we finish the, che the chapter as Jesus speaks to his deity. He explains who testified to his deity, being the Son of God and how his deity is acknowledged by God through the powers that he demonstrated as he healed the sick, cast out demons, and called the dead back to life. So this morning, the title of my message is The Deity of Jesus Christ. We're in the fifth chapter of John. Stand with me, if you will. We'll read a few verses here, beginning in verse 30. Jesus says, And I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he bare witness unto the truth. But I received not testimony from man, but these things I say, that ye might be saved. He, is, he was a burning and shining light, and ye were willing for a, a season to rejoice in his light. 
But I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent him ye believe not. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Let us pray. Lord, we love you this morning. We thank you for uh, the words recorded in John chapter 5, Lord, that we can uh, trust and understand that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is God, Lord, and he has power over life and death. And Lord, and when we pray in his name that we're not uh, uh, praying a fruitless prayer, but uh, Lord, just help us to trust in, in Jesus as God and uh, to live this life in a manner that would be pleasing to him. We ask it in your name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. One of our foundational truths of Christianity is the deity of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is God. He is the Son of God, and they are one. Jesus left heaven and came to the earth in the flesh, born to the Virgin Mary. Jesus Although he faced many trials and temptations, just like we do, he never sinned. Because Jesus was without sin, he was the only sacrifice that could satisfy God's punishment for the sin of man, and that was the shedding of his blood. Peter, Peter spoke of, of Jesus in the book of Acts and said this to the Sadducees about Jesus in uh, Acts 4.12. Neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus was crucified, buried in a borrowed tomb, but he rose three days later. And today he sits at the right hand of the Father. Because he lives, you and I are able to live for all eternity as well. If you don't believe that, if you don't have that, then you got nothing. You got nothing. And we're living in a world and a society today that there, uh, there's a whole smorgasbord of religions out there for you to choose from. Uh, I was reading a book last night by MacArthur on the war on truth. And, uh, you know, today there's all these movements and what they're saying is that you can't know truth. It's impossible because of the subjective mind of a human being for them to know an objective truth. And I will tell you what they're trying to say to you is you can't know God. That's what they're saying to you. You can't know God because God is truth. And so they're, they're putting all this in thing that, that Albert, uh, Brother Albert can have a God to his liking. Brother Justin can have a God to his liking. Brother Donnie can have a God to his liking. And we all can have a God that caters to us. They've created this God that, that uh, uh, bows and serves to the human flesh. And, of course, we know that that's a lie. If you don't believe in the deity of Jesus then you have nothing as far as eternity is concerned. Without his deity, there could be no salvation. Without salvation, there could be no uh, life with the Father in heaven. Without his deity, there's nothing but damnation. In verse 30, Jesus continues his assertion with these Jews. Now remember, he's talking to these Jewish leaders, and of course, uh, they're in a uh, situation now where they're upset with him because he's healed this man on the Sabbath, and they're questioning this man, say, well, uh, who told you you could take your bed and walk? It's the Sabbath. You know that that's a sin. And, and of course, the man didn't know who Jesus was. And later in the temple, they had this conversation. Jesus told him, said, you know, go and sin no more or a worse thing would come upon you. And then this man's able to say to them, well, it was Jesus that healed me. And so naturally now at this point, they're uh, quite uh, irritated and incensed with Jesus. And they're beginning to contemplate in their hearts and their minds how they can eradicate Jesus from the face of the earth. And they're, all, and they're doing this as good Jews. They're doing this because they're strong in their Jewish faith. Because they think that they're protecting their, their religion. But what they're trying to protect are oral traditions. Things that the, uh, the rabbis had come up with in order to uh, maintain the Sabbath in what they thought was an appropriate manner. So in verse 30, he says, I can't on my own... Uh, self do nothing. As I fear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. So here we learn that Jesus, he didn't come to earth and uh, act independently of God the Father. He came to do uh, the Father's will. He was commissioned by God the Father to come into the world for a purpose, to redeem lost souls. 
And in order to redeem lost souls, one must help the lost to recognize the sin in their lives and help them realize God's love for them and that they can be set free if they will repent of those sins and accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Um, obviously, in this, and it's getting harder, I think, in this day and age because of all the false doctrines that are out there. You've got to be able to help someone to understand the error of their way. And nobody wants to hear that they're living their life wrong. They don't want to hear that they have sin in their life. Nobody, you know, wants to be offended in such a way. Uh, I don't know of anyone that would intentionally choose the wrong way in life, that, that they would say, well, I know I'm living a life that's going to end me up in hell. Uh, I think most people want to think that they're pretty good people and that when they die, they're going to go to heaven. But there's so many people out there that are being deceived with these false doctrines that it's hard to get through to them to say that, hey, you know, the things that you're doing in life, Folks, I talk to people all the time that are uh, living together out of, out of wedlock and uh, they're in an adulterous uh, relationship. And uh, I talk to people that they're liars, they're thieves, they're, uh, they're all these things in this world and they believe that they're Christians going to heaven. My Bible doesn't teach that. Uh, I have a hard time. I worry about people that do such things. Jesus says... As I hear, I judge. Or one could say that Jesus called it like, it like he saw it. Jesus continually dealt with the sinful Jews and Gentiles. But as Jesus would encounter the Jews and their false beliefs, these oral traditions, Jesus would rebuke them. He didn't uh, uh, just let it, let it slide. It never went over well with these arrogant Jews. They never, they never liked it because they thought that they were above everybody. They thought that they were perfect and all these things. But the great thing about Jesus' judgment is that it is always just and true. Jesus wasn't pushing his agenda, but what he was doing was what the Father had sent him to do. So when he judged something as being sinful, it wasn't his opinion. It wasn't because he had an axe to grind. It was because in the eyes of the Father, it is sin. So let me try to bring this down and boil it down to us today. Jesus is trying to tell these, these men that God the Father sent me. And my judgment is true because the Father's judgment is true. I don't do anything outside of his will. I don't do anything outside of his character. So uh, if you say that you believe in God, then you should believe in me. And I'm telling you that these things are wrong. Then you should just understand that they are wrong. So... How does that boil down to us? Well, when we go to the Bible and we begin to read the Word of God, we say we believe in God, we say we believe, and we begin to read the Word, and the Word says that thou shalt not do this or that, then we shouldn't be doing those things. If it says that we should do this and we should do that, then we should be doing those things. But we got people today, I forget what the percentages are, but we have a problem in the world today amongst Christians, and that's biblical ignorance. People don't read their Bible, so they don't understand what it is they're supposed to be doing. They don't understand how they're supposed to be living. And so what they do is they just base their life off of opinions about bouncing around in the world and, and uh, uh, what opinions are out there and what's prevalent at the time and what's going on in our culture. They themselves haven't asked the question, well, what do I believe? What do I believe, say it, the Word of God? Jesus' judgment would never have been unjust or, or tainted in any way because he could not act independent of the Father. If the Jews would have received this truth, then it would have been simple for them to apply all of Jesus' teachings to their lives. Let me tell you what, you can't take one or two of Jesus' teaching and apply it to your life and then ignore the rest of them and say, well, those are too harsh, those are too complicated, those are too time-consuming. Uh, I'll, I'll just leave those over here. And I'll just do the things over here that are convenient to me, that are easy, that don't take a lot of time. There's people that are doing it. I think one of the biggest uh, things that people are fooling themselves with, uh, when I meet someone for the first time and they tell me they're Christian, first thing I ask them, where do you go to church? And you would be shocked to understand how many times these people look me in the eye and say, oh, I don't go to church. I don't want to go down there with those people. So it, uh, it, it always amazes me. It's important for us to study the Word of God. It is through our study of His Word that we can learn God's judgment of sin and adjust our lives accordingly. We live in a day and time when people are calling good evil and evil good. And what has to matter above all to the confessed believers is, are we living according to God's judgment as to what is good and what is evil? 
If God says it's good, then we're good to go. If he says it's evil, then we need to abstain from it. But too many people out there today, they're getting all wrapped into this, these uh, philosophies of man, and, and they're trying to uh, sound like they're important, sound like they're very knowledgeable and all these things. And, and some of them, are intellectually, they're geniuses. But they got nothing spiritually. They got nothing in their heart. If God says that it's wrong, then we need to abstain. If you're a liar, you need to stop lying. If you're a thief, you need to quit stealing. These are the things that God tells us that we shouldn't be doing. In verse 31, Jesus said, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Now, Jesus is not saying that his testimony is untruthful, but that the Jews will not accept his testimony alone, and, and so he will offer other witnesses to his deity. In the Old Testament law, it was a requirement to have two or three witnesses in order to settle a matter legally. In Deuteronomy 19.15, one witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin, and any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. One of the things that we see that happens in the world today is there's so many people that, uh, I don't know about where you work or people you interact with, people will, will throw out accusations and innuendos and and people will take those, those statements and they will run with it as fact. I remember years ago when I was in security, there was a guy, and they just began to tease him about being lazy. And he wasn't, he wasn't lazy. He was one of our better controllers. And, uh, but however this rumor got started, uh, they all started teasing him about it. And this went on and on and on, and it just got legs, and it just kept going and going and going. And come time for layoffs... They laid him off. They laid him off because he was lazy. But I'm telling you, I worked with the man. He wasn't. But that's just the, 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 the rumor that had been perpetuated over time. People say things like that. So the Jews said, in order for you to make an accusation, in order for there to be a problem be solved, you've got to have two witnesses. You've got to have two people come into the room and say that so-and-so did the same thing. They have to have the exact same word. Remember when Christ was being accused, they couldn't find two or three witnesses to accuse him. So the Jews, I suspect that these Jews simply didn't want to believe Jesus. And so they probably fell back on this law and said, well, we, we're not going to believe just you. You know, your word alone isn't enough. So that's okay. Because as you read the text, Jesus is going to give them four additional witnesses that testified to his being as the Son of God. The first witness, John the Baptist. There is another beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that ye might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. John the Baptist was ordained to be the herald of Jesus Christ. His purpose was to announce the arrival of the Messiah. John had a divine revelation that Jesus was the Messiah, and he was determined to share that revelation with the world. In the first chapter of John, verses 32 through 34, and John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Amen. John was there. He witnessed the Spirit descending and remaining on him. Uh, having seen God's confirmation that Jesus was the Messiah, John began to testify to that fact. John's devotion to sharing the message of Jesus would ultimately cost him his life. If you're sitting here this morning as a child of God, if you're sitting here this morning and you claim to be a Christian, that you've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then what you uh, have, what you should possess within you is the uh, indwelling of the Holy Spirit and that you, you should be testifying who Jesus is. John was there. John saw. And then John testified. As a born again believer. You were there. 
You experience Jesus Christ. You experience the salvation of Jesus Christ. You experience the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. And you should testify. You should testify to that fact. Unapologetically, I'll add, I think one thing that we see in the, in the Christian world today is that we have people that they want to apologize for being strong in their faith. Well, I don't mean to offend anybody. The truth can be offensive. Do you understand that? The truth can be offensive. Just ask us husbands. The wife will ask us a question, and you know, or, uh, how does this dress look? Or does you know the ultimate, the worst question in the world to be asked is, this dress make me look fat? <laughs> and, you know, I don't know how you're not going to win that one. You know, so it's like like the old joke. The guy said to his wife, said, does, does my dress make me look fat? He said, no, your fat makes you look fat. So, you know, there's times where you, I don't know, you don't want to, you don't want to share the truth too, too gen, uh, generously. But we have been equipped in Acts 1.8. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So we've been equipped through the power of the Holy Spirit to be a witness of Jesus Christ and his saving grace. People say to me all the time, well, I'm not able to talk to people. I'm not able to, you know, and I understand there's some people that have the gift of gab and there's others that don't. I don't have the gift of gab. Uh, I think I can get up and and teach a class. I think I can speak and and what have you. But as far as uh, going out into the street and just just being able to strike up a conversation and have that gift, uh, I don't think I have that, but I have to work at it. Uh, I know when we go downtown Titusville, uh, I'll never forget the first time we did it, uh, myself and Brother Nick, we stood out in the, in the street there, and everybody else was kind of piled in underneath the canopy, you know, nobody, nobody was too anxious to get out there and encounter what, whatever was going on. Uh, but as time went on, more and more people drifted out, more and more people got involved in witnessing the people and, and talking. That's the only way you're going to get better at it is to do it. Uh, you just have to try. So there are people in this world that are willing to share their beliefs, but the problem is they're sharing a false doctrine. It's always been one of the things that I find curious is how that people who are living a lie, people that believe in a lie, are so bold in sharing that lie. And those of us who we believe we have the truth, sometimes it seems like that we want to whisper that truth. You know, we don't want to shout it out and, and have people to understand that there is, a, uh, there is a, uh, uh, a right way and a wrong way. In Galatians 1.8, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. In Paul's days, there were many false doctrines as well. I think one book that I read said that there was like 70 uh, gospels being presented in that day and time. And... Here in in Galatians chapter 1, Paul addresses the church into how quickly some have abandoned the gospel of Jesus Christ that Paul himself had shared with them. He says to them uh, in the first part of that chapter, he says to them, I'm surprised at how soon you are departed from the gospel of Jesus Christ which I presented to you. These people were being uh, swayed by false doctrines and they were departing the the truth in order to go follow a lie. Those that bring a false gospel into the world will be cursed, and they will be judged at the great white throne of judgment. The sad thing about false doctrines is that that too many people adopt them, and in doing so they condemn themselves to eternal punishment. I was listening to John MacArthur the other day, and he was talking about a lot of our preachers that have kind of gotten off the the main path. And he names them by name, and my buddy was in there too. And, uh, And he begins to explain that, what, uh, what his opinion is about where they've erred and one of the things that they're trying to do and what have you. Uh, you and I need to be witnesses. We need to testify to the lost in this world about Jesus. When we uh, fail to be a witness of the truth of Jesus Christ, we open the door for those who would perpetuate a false doctrine to succeed. If you sit there and you listen to someone and they're telling a lie and, they, and they're confused or uh, they're misled, and you just sit there silently because you don't want to offend them or you don't want to get uh, involved in a controversial conversation, then what you've allowed is that false doctrine to be perpetuated uh, through their statements. In verse 35, Jesus says about John, he was a burning and a shining light and you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. 
when John first came on the scene, he was preaching that the Messiah is coming. And so the Jews were excited about it, and they, were, uh, they loved John, and they loved listening to his message because they, they talked about the Messiah that is coming. But then when Jesus came on the, on the scene, they began to reject him. Why is that? Well, they had in their minds that the, the Messiah was going to come into the world. He'd ride in on a white horse. He'd be waving his sword. And with that sword, he would overthrow the Roman government and that he would establish his kingdom here on earth. And that, especially for our uh, apostles, they thought that they were getting on the ground floor or something and that they would have high offices, uh, offices in the kingdom and that they would uh, be well rewarded. But when Jesus showed up, he was the son of a poor carpenter. And he wasn't uh, charismatic. He was authoritative, but he wasn't charismatic. And so when Jesus began to rebuke the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes, and he began to call them out on their false doctrine, naturally that didn't go over well. And so now the message of John is not as exciting as it was. I would tell you that I think that what happens with people that when they first come to the Lord is that uh, people sometimes they come, they, they accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but they don't really know anything. When I got saved, I didn't know a whole lot about the Bible. Uh, I got saved because I didn't want to go to hell. All right? And over through years of study, and over, I got to know Jesus Christ and God the Father and how much they love me. And, and those are the things that you know, my hope are placed in today. But I think there's people that come and they really don't understand the whole ball of wax. And as they begin to read, as they begin to sit in service, and they begin to understand what Scripture tells them, then their enthusiasm begins to wane because they begin to realize that, you know, these things over here that I've grabbed onto, like I was telling the young people earlier, they've grabbed onto sin in their life and they don't want to let go. And Scripture's telling them, you got to let go of it. And you got you to choose Jesus Christ. And they just... They're not going to let go. And so it begins to lose its excitement and uh, people begin to, to fade uh, in their enthusiasm for Jesus. Jesus arrived in the world as a totally different figure than what they had preconceived. He came as a poor carpenter and then with him beginning to rebuke him. And these people, they had based their religion on the traditions of man and Jesus did not turn a blind eye. Let me tell you something. Some of these folks, you listen to them when they talk and uh, they're, they're spewing their false doctrine. They do so with vigor. They do so with confidence. They, some of them do it with arrogance. And I think you just need to learn how to ask a few questions. Like, you know, well, how did you come to that conclusion? And then ask them to explain it to you. How, 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 did, you get, how did you get to there? Uh, because let me tell you what I have found in life and in, in, in the Christians as well, is that a lot of people, they say they believe things, but they really don't know what they believe in. You begin to ask them to break it down and say, well, what do you believe? What do you believe? And they can't tell you. And I've got to tell you, that's one of the black marks against Christians in the world today. I've had, I don't know, how many people say to me, you know, well, most Christians I talk to, they don't even know what they believe. I had a guy ask me that before a meeting one time, and I was in the room with a couple of lieutenant colonels and a major and, and what have you. And I said, well, I know what I believe. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He came in the flesh. He died. Three days later, he rose again. And because he did that, I'll live again some other day, too. And so I was able, and then I thought in my mind, I said, well, thank you for giving me that opportunity to witness. And uh, so, but we need to be able to state what we believe. What do you believe? When I first answered the call to preach, we had... Uh, uh, Brother uh, Ainge was uh, doing a revival in Melbourne. Uh, Brother Ainge is now the uh, president at Southeastern College. And so we were at lunch, and uh, he recommended a couple books for me to read. And one of them was uh, Spurgeon's, uh, I think it was Spurgeon, Lessons to My Students. I opened that book, and I began to read the foreword. And to basically what it said was, don't go, go, don't go into you any further with this book until you know what you believe. And I set that book aside. I haven't touched it because I'm spending my time because I want to know what I believe. Uh, and I think that people need to do that. People need to know what they believe. I think that if you're confident in your, in your doctrine, that if you're confident in your, 
faith in Jesus Christ, that you'll be more apt to stand up against the evil in this world. It's the people that are wishy-washy that don't really understand what it is they believe and they don't feel like they have a firm foundation. Uh, look, there's people, I know there's going to be people that disagree with me. I've had people disagree with me all my life. If they want to be wrong, that's their choice, okay? Uh, they, can, they can do that. Uh, I'm not right all the time, but I know that I believe in, in this Bible and I know I believe in the teaching of God's Word. And I feel like, for me, I feel like I've got a good foundation. You can come try to knock me off, but you're never going to get there. I used to have a friend that, you know, we had some, uh, we're both Christians, and we had some differences of opinion about some things in the Bible. And uh, when we were on night shift together, we would sit and talk, and, and basically he would look at me and he'd say, I'm not convincing you, am I? I said, no, you're not. But we could, we could have those conversations without uh, getting angry. Jesus was not what the Jews had envisioned in their Messiah, and so they rejected him. If you stand up for the truth, there are going to be those who are going to reject you. They're not going to want you around. There's people when I walk into a room that all of a sudden some of the jokes, you know, the joke telling gets stopped and uh, some of the language changes, which is a good thing. I appreciate that. Uh, I have people that, you know, apologize to me all the time. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say that. I said, that's between you and God. I'm okay. You know, you work it out with the Lord. I'm okay. We see the same thing today. Men and women have a preconceived notion about God and eternity, and they get all warm and fuzzy uh, as they contemplate life with God in heaven. But as they begin to get uh, down the road a little bit in their Christian walk, they find out that it gets a little bit heavy and that there's some uh, consequences for being a child of God. So the second witness that Jesus offers them is the works of Jesus. In verse 36, But I have greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. The second witness of Jesus' deity were the very works that he did. In John chapter 3, we read where Nicodemus, a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin, comes to Jesus. And he says to him, There was a man, a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Sometimes I look at our world and I'm amazed at uh, people that would deny the existence of God. Just look at the the, uh, uh, wonders of what's going on in this world as far as uh, uh, the scenery and, and the function of the universe and what have you. I don't know how a person can be a, a parent and had experienced experience childbirth and they would deny the existence of God. Those things uh, just don't register with me. Nicodemus was in awe of the teaching of Jesus as well as the miracles that Jesus had performed. He said that no one other than someone who had come from God can do these things. When we look around, the, the witness and the testimony of, of, of God is everywhere. And people should know. Even if John had never come and to, to tell them that the Messiah was coming, what Nicodemus was saying is, I have seen with my eyes, I've heard with my ears. You must be, you must be from God. His word spoke to many people, and they questioned if Jesus was not the Messiah. In John chapter 7, verse 31, And many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? The Jews, they knew the teaching of the prophets. They knew when the Messiah would come that he would do wondrous works. And what these group of people, they were believing, they were saying, this guy, God, it has to be the Messiah. And what they're saying is, and, and the reasoning that they're using is, are you telling us that when you say he's not the Messiah, so when the Messiah you say is coming, is he going to do more miracles than what Jesus has done? John, in the, in the latter part here, I don't remember what chapter 20 or 21, where he says that, that not everything that Jesus did was recorded. But the things that were recorded were so that we could believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Nicodemus said, I can, I can see it. These people were saying, I can see it. We should be able to see how the Lord's working. 
in the, the chapter 7 there, the situation is very dynamic. The Pharisees are plotting to kill Jesus, but Jesus has not been deterred and still teaches and speaks boldly even under the threat of death. The people are divided. Some believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and others believe that this is a crazy man under the influence of Satan. The wise man, though, asked the question, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? In today's vernacular, we might say, If it looks like a duck, and if it quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. Jesus was doing things only the Messiah could do. And people, there were those in the group that said, He has to be, and I believe. Jesus taught and performed miracles like the Messiah would. And so this is where they base their belief on. So the third witness that Jesus offers them is God the Father himself. In verses 37 and 38. And the Father himself which has sent me hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent him ye believe not. Jesus wasn't done in verses 37 and 38, he asserts that God the Father, his Father, is also a witness of Jesus as being the Son of God. The Jews had never seen or heard God's voice, but Jesus was saying that they had heard from God through the word of the prophets. The only problem here was that they were not demonstrating a belief in God's word when rejecting Jesus, who God had sent to them. What he's saying is this. You say you believe in God. You say you've read the word of God. The word of God tells you that I'm, I'm coming. And now I'm here. And because you're rejecting me, you're rejecting the word of God. You're rejecting the word of God. You're rejecting God. And that's what we see in our society today. People reject the teaching of the word of God. And so when they're rejecting that word, they're rejecting God himself. But they think somehow, I don't understand in today's world, we have certain uh, groups of, of people who they think for some reason that they should be able to keep their sin and still go to heaven. Well, the way I understand scripture is that no sin will enter into heaven. And so you've got, you've got a dynamic there that's going to uh, prove to be faulty. You can't be a sinner and a saint. It just won't work out. So here Jesus is offering the witness of the Father. One of the things that I have been shocked about during my Christian walk is how men and women confess Jesus Christ and they just, I don't know, they ignore his word. His word. I've been told some pretty weird things in my day. Uh, when I was a deacon down in Melbourne, I had a lady come to me and she offered this up. I wasn't chasing her down or anything. And she just kind of began, she was kind of bragging to be honest with you. She was telling me that her and her boyfriend would, would lie in bed at night and study their Bible together. Well, there's a problem with that. Number one, they weren't married. And number two, she was married. And I was just, I was, I'll be honest with you, I was just knocked off my feet. I just couldn't believe that somebody would, would, would tell me that and believe that it was a good thing. I used to work with a guy. He was married. And he believed, so he said, that he could have extramarital relations with a woman as long as she was a virgin, it wasn't adultery. And so I was like, okay, you know, but these are just some of the things that people have said to me over the years. And I'm like, you're crazy. You're just crazy. Through Satan's influence, people throughout all ages have been deceived to believe that they could live in sin and still receive the promise of God's kingdom. It doesn't work that way. Jesus was saying to these Jews that if they had the word of God in them, then they would be able to recognize him as the Messiah. Jesus was the fulfillment of every prophecy of the Messiah, and they should have, because of God's word, been able to recognize him. I will say this to you, that if you're studying your Bible, if, that, uh, if you're paying attention to what the word of God says, you will be able to recognize sin. You should be able to recognize truth from a lie. And the only way you're ever going to get there is through the study of this book. I have so many people that, I just don't know what God wants from me. Well, I'll tell you what he wants you to do. Let me tell you what God wants from you. God wants you to be invested in him. God wants you to study his word. God wants you to live a life that brings honor and glory to him. Uh, what he wants you to do is he wants you to have a life. Let me tell you what, 
One of the things that's just a, a total waste of time in this world is a Christian who lives their life with their head down and being uh, uh, full of guilt and shame and uh, weak back uh, because that is not the life that God has, has designed for you and I. Through the salvation of Jesus Christ, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, what he has given us has given us the power over sin. And with that power over sin, he expects us to walk through this life with our head up, all right, our hearts full, filled with joy, and to be able to, as we encounter these problems in life, to do so with, with hope and faith and the consistency to know that there will be victory for us on the other side. We got too many Christians walking around today feeling sorry for themselves. Well, so-and-so doesn't like me. Well, guess what? If, if so-and-so doesn't like you because you're a Christian, pray for them because they're headed for hell. But you don't need their affirmation in order to enter into God's kingdom. Amen? We got too many people out there that are trying to please man. We got too many people they want to be they want to be part of the in crowd. They want to uh, they want to be cool. You go and you read these articles, just drives me insane. We've got parents in the world today that are allowing their children to to do drugs and alcohol in their house because it's safer. Safer from what? You need to get on your face and, and repent your sins before God and begin to teach your children about Jesus Christ and about salvation. Teach your children to love Jesus. You want your child to be uh, uh, successful in life? You want your child to be happy in life? You want your child to be uh, well-balanced in this world? Teach them about Jesus. Teach them right from wrong. This deal today where everybody says that my truth is my truth. Uh, Brother Albert's truth is Brother Albert's truth. All right? That's not the way it works. There's only one truth. And that's the truth of God's word. And that's how we're going to be judged. I don't care how, they, how many times they change the laws. They can say that, that same-sex marriage is legal. That doesn't make it moral. And that doesn't make it right in the eyes of God. And they're going to be judged for that based on what's written in his word. So people that are trying to please men are messing up. They're making a, a big mistake. And I will tell you something. If you go through this world and you're confident in your doctrine, you're confident in your belief in Jesus Christ, you know what? People, even though they may uh, have an, a, an opposing view of everything that you believe in, they will respect you. They might even fear you. Because if you don't back down to that stuff, let me tell you what, I didn't go to, I didn't go to school until I was 37, 38 as far as college went. So I was going to night school down here and some of the stuff, and some of these classes, most of them were working people like me, but there were a few young people there that I think they were just wasting mommy and daddy's dime trying to get a degree. But we'd be in these classes and uh, I took a few theology classes at Barry and um, we'd get in there and of course all these philosophical debates would, would arouse up and, and so uh, we'd get into things and I would say something and someone would say, well, you, oh, are you kidding me? And then one night, this one guy, he stood up, he said, let me tell you something about this guy. I've been in a few classes with him. He doesn't waver. He doesn't waver. So he believes what he's telling you. So when you think, when you don't necessarily think people are watching, they're paying attention to you, especially if you say you're a Christian. They're watching because they're looking for you to mess up so they can throw it in your face. But if you're consistent in your walk, you don't have to be perfect in your walk because we're not going to be. You're consistent in your walk, and you treat them like human beings, and you share the love of Jesus Christ with them, they will respect you. And finally, the fourth witness, the words of Scripture. Verse 39 says, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So lastly, Jesus asserts that the Scriptures testify of him. You want to know about Jesus? Go read the Bible. Read the New Testament. Read the Old Testament. Let me tell you what. In the beginning was God. Jesus was there. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are one. Jesus has been, Jesus has been throughout Scripture. In John chapter 1, verse 45, Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, we have found him of, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Philip recognized that he had found the Messiah. How did he recognize that? Because he had read 
he had read the word of God. And based on what he had read and based on what he had seen and what he had heard, he recognized Jesus to be the Messiah. The Bible is about Jesus. You can boil the Bible down to two main thoughts. Number one, man in his own self is hopelessly lost. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, man has been at war with sin and the influence of Satan. Even when you read about the heroes in the Bible, those great men, these great prophets, when you read about them in the Bible, Moses. Moses was chosen by God to lead his people out of bondage in Egypt. But Moses was a murderer. And ultimately, when uh, they got into the wilderness, Moses was denied being able to lead the children into the promised land because he had disobeyed God. David. The Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. But he committed adultery. And then he committed murder in order to uh, hide his sin. Noah. Noah was chosen by God to save mankind from the universal flood. But yet after the flood, Noah got drunk and he got naked. And then there's Abraham, the man whom God chose to make a covenant whereby all of mankind will be blessed through his lineage. But Abraham and Sarah couldn't wait on God. So we'll give God a hand. And so uh, Sarah gave Haggai to him in order to have a son. Even when we read about the great men of God, we see their sinful natures come to the forefront. Man will always be at war with his sin uh, until he departs from this world. That's one of the things that I hope we learn from the Word of God, that, that these men, these great men that we think that were, somehow I think we begin to assign some supernatural being to Moses and to Abraham and to Peter and John and so forth. But we read about them and we read that they were flawed. Peter was impetuous. Peter was always sounding off when he should have kept his mouth shut. James and John, evidently, you know, got, uh, the Lord called them you know, sons of thunder because they had bad tempers. When you read that, you realize that they were just men like you and I. That in itself should teach us something. That our brothers and sisters in Christ are not going to be perfect. They're going to err along the way. But so many people, whenever they see a Christian uh, stumble and fall, they want to go over and take that Bible and beat them over the head with it and, and beat them into submission. I would tell you that what you need to do is you need to go over and kneel down beside them and give them a hand and, and help lift them up and encourage them. So many times we want to take a, a flaw in a person and just use it to make ourselves feel better. Secondly, the Bible speaks about a Savior that would be sent by God to redeem man to God. Although man had sinned in the garden, God would provide a means for all of mankind to be reconciled with him. See, all God ever wanted from man was, for, was to love them and for them to, uh, uh, to love God. That's all he wanted out of this relationship. When he put Adam and Eve in the garden, he gave them every, every need that they had was filled. God said, I just, want to, I just want to take care of you. And then he said, well, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now they had a choice. And, of course, we know Satan tempted them and said, well, God just don't want you to be like him. He don't want you to be smart like a god. And began to dangle that fruit in front of Eve. And she saw that it was good to the eyes. And she had this pride and wanted to be like God. And so they sinned. They said, you know what? God, I don't need you to take care of my needs. God, I don't need you to fulfill my, my, my physical needs in order to live in this perfect world you've given us. Adam and Eve existed in a perfect world. And they said, God, I don't need you to supply my needs. God wants you and I to trust him today and to say, God, I trust you to supply my needs where we get sidelined sometimes is we confuse our needs with our wants. And we begin to confuse the two. I've always said, you know, you, you can be hungry and you can offer someone a bologna sandwich. And if they turn it down, then they ain't hungry enough. If they think they've got to have steak and potatoes every time, then, then you know, you're missing the boat. You're missing the boat. <coughs> The Bible speaks about a Savior. 
Moses and the prophets had written about such a Savior, and the words that they had written were now a testimony to the deity of Jesus Christ. So Jesus went on to point out to them the error of their ways in verses 45 through 47. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? The scriptures told about Jesus' coming. Moses and the prophets wrote about him. Now these Jews said that we, they, you know, they, they placed high stock in, in Moses and the prophets and the law. And the law told about the coming Messiah. And Jesus is saying that they told you I was coming and now you're rejecting what you read. When we begin to reject the word of God, we're going to find ourselves in a bad place. He said, if you're rejecting the words of Moses, then you're not going to accept my word. There are those today who will reject Jesus as the Son of God. Some say he was a good prophet. Others say he was a very charismatic individual who was able to generate a small gathering. Still others say he was nothing more than a troublemaker. And then there are those who simply deny that he was. In the garden, man sinned. In the garden, God shed blood to cover Adam and Eve's nakedness. As a result of man's sin, God sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for all of our sins. Unless you believe the word of God in the fact that it teaches that Jesus Christ is our Savior, you can never redeem yourself. You have to confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You have to go to him. But our society today... People don't like to bow down to anyone. People don't like authority. People want to challenge authority. It's become a, a, uh, a cultural, iconic thing, I believe, where, you know, if I can stand up and, and oppose uh, authority in some manner, that will get my face on the 6 o'clock news. And so people strive for that. Uh, they think it's being courageous to be uh, indignant and to uh, oppose uh, leadership. And that carries over into their religious beliefs. I'm not gonna bow down to God, you know. Uh, I don't know if I believe that stuff and what have you. And it's sad, it's sad. You go and you study the Word of God. You study that fifth chapter of John and you realize who Jesus is. It's very clear. If you say you believe the Bible, then you can't read that chapter and come to the end of it and not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That's the only conclusion that you can come to. Have you ever truly repented of your sins? Have you ever accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Are you confident in the doctrine and the beliefs that you have adopted for your life.